introduce you to today's presenter, Dr. Ross D. Coletto. Dr. Ross D. Coletto has been involved in occupational health and safety and occupational hygiene for over 35 years, with experience in the power industry, mining, and refining in Australia and internationally. He's, he has a PhD in occupational health and a Master of Science by Research in health stre Heat Stress and is currently an Adjunct Associate Professor at the University of Queensland and Griffith University. He is a Certified Occupational Hygienist and a Fellow and Past President of the Australian Institute of Occupational Hygienists and the current President-elect. He's also a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Health and Safety. One of Ross's areas uh, of particular in interest includes heat stress and the thermal environment, and he's authored a number of papers and reference documents in the area. Ross is currently the Principal Consultant and Director of Monitor Consulting Services based in Brisbane, Australia. So I'll hand you over to Ross to begin. Thank you. Hopefully we can all get this to work. Uh, I am a total IT uh, dummy here, so hopefully it'll all work uh, fine for us. So let's see what happens. All right. And already, gotcha. All right. So when uh, Zach first approached me to do a presentation in this area, I thought, oh, yeah, that sounds pretty straightforward, a nice simple one. Um, and then I started looking into it, and it's a little bit more complicated than I thought. So it's been a real learning exercise for me as well. So hopefully you'll pick some things up as we go. So let's see. So two areas of PPE for discussion that we're going to go into. The first one is respiratory protection. So, Hi. yep. So sorry to do that, but um, I'm Sam here. Can I get you to just share your screen, please? Ooh, I thought I had, did have it shared. Get back into it. Yes, please. That says stop sharing. Oh, I see. Yep, and then try again. Okay. How's that? Yep, perfect. Okay. I, told you, I thought something was going to go wrong. Always happens with this. Okay, sorry about that. Um, now, two areas, respiratory protection, half-phase negative pressure. Oh, let me just go back. So we'll look at half-phase negative pressures, including disposables. We'll also look at um, full-phase negative pressure respirators. The other area we're going to dabble into is clothing. So standard work uniforms and coveralls, including and disposables. So I'll try and cover each one of those. Now, first off, always like to touch on the thermal balance equation. For me, it's an important uh, part of heat stress. It looks complicated, but it really is pretty straightforward. And if you can understand some of the components, it really helps you when you're looking at controls and looking at the impact of heat stress on the individual. So S is the important one. That's the rate of heat storage. So if S is negative, we lose heat. If S is positive, we gain heat, hence the heat stress. M is the rate of metabolic heat production. So this is uh, obviously the harder you work, the more heat you're going to generate. And uh, it plays an important role in internal heat production. W is the external work performed by or on the body, which I tend not to dabble into too much on this one. The important ones are things like the heat exchange via evaporation, very important. Uh, particularly in relation to sweat evaporation because it's a key, a key cooling process for us. Then we have uh, heat exchange via radiation, heat exchange via convection, and heat exchange via conduction. So they all play an important role. Radiation, obviously, in uh, places like smelters and any um, anywhere where there's heat being given off by a, a hot molten metals or ovens or those sorts of things. Convection, obviously, in the air and conduction has less of an impact, but still uh, needs to be considered. It's, so that's obviously when you're leaning on things. So PPE may cause discomfort or heat stress. So that's two 
specific areas. We can have thermal comfort and we can have uh, actual heat stress itself. And often within PPE, the two combine together. So you can get the physiological, where the body experiences excessive stress when PPE is worn. And the second one is the, the psychophysical, where the discomfort is more of a, of a mental perception than a physical burden. So you'll see, like, when we look at respirators, things like claustrophobia and that, that have an impact on the wearing of the, uh, the PPE, but don't technically have a, 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 a physical impact. But again, once they play together, they can be quite important. Respiratory protection is the first one we'll look at. So they can impose stresses from the, the significant physiological through to the general discomfort of the wearer. So they can be quite straightforward, uh, but others are a little bit more subjective and difficult to assess, but can be just as important. So you can get uh, impacts from breathing resistance, increases in warmth and humidity, increase in facial sweating, and also the variation of the CO2 levels within the respirator. One other one to consider is breathing resistance for disposable face fitting respirators. Now, we've seen a lot of um, uh, these on the, on the um, as a result of the COVID scenario that we have. So the disposable uh, face fitting respirators are becoming uh, a lot more common. They're being used within uh, the, the health scenarios. Our, our healthcare workers are using them. Uh, so there is a question of how much of an impact in relation to breathing resistance do we have? Now, generally, there's not a significant physiological stress on the wearer uh, for the, of the modern respirators, uh, but this is mainly in mo moderate to low work areas, work rates, sorry. And I'll, I'll, I'll go into the other, the, the heavier workloads a bit later on. But some of this initial work that was done by, uh, and, and is reported in the literature, tends to focus on uh, moderate to low work rates. And it's saying that generally there's not a significant impact on the physiological stress. They have obviously a great impact during elevated work rates. And you saw this in, uh, again, in some of the COVID uh, uh, information that was provided you didn't have to wear you had to wear a face uh, a disposable face fitting respirator but if you were doing some uh, um, exercise then you had the option of, of taking it off and it was in, it'd be in that sort of exercise scenario or heavy work scenario that they actually do start to impact now with breathing resistance not not much actually has a set criteria uh, and they're saying that the pressure should not exceed 35 millimetres of water in resistance. Now, in relation to modern respirators, modern disposable respirators, it's normally not an issue because they, they tend to be quite low, around about the, uh, the 10 millimetres. So the, uh, one of the, the general well-known respirators uh, and correctly uh, manufactured respirators would come in at around about that 10 millimetre of uh, water level. Uh, just on that one, we are seeing a lot of, um, I won't say dodgy, but a, a lot of questionable respirators appearing uh, on the market. And you may not find that they meet this criteria. So that's just something also to bear in mind, apart from all the other uh, issues that uh, are apparent with uh, some of the uh, less reliable respirators or the, the non-certified. As far as physiological impacts go, um, we can see an increase of approximately seven to seven and a half degrees C in the, the dead space temperature. So that dead space is the, the front part of the respirator where there's poor air movement and gases such as carbon dioxide can accumulate. So that seven to seven and a half degrees can be quite a significant amount and it can impose a, um, a, a form of discomfort on the wearer. Uh, heat loss via the respiratory tract you know, that's one of our important ways of, of, um, uh, of, of losing heat in, uh, from the body itself. And that it's approximately 11% of the total heat loss from the body. And you're now putting something over your face to contain that. And it doesn't go out, uh, it's not released as, as quickly and as easily. And it's going to build up. 
humidity is another one range of 90 percent to 100 percent under the face under the uh, the respirator not uncommon so again in higher temperatures and hotter climates high humidities you're going to get some, some discomfort from that uh, that increase in humidity so if you start combining high skin temperatures elevated air temperatures skin wetness you're going to end up in some some discomfort and potentially physiological stress so the wearing of a respirator and again particularly in uh, heavy workloads is going to uh, impose some issues i did some digging in the uh, um, literature to find out who had done studies in this area and there's actually not not a great deal in relation to um, the disposable respirators but I did find some work, uh, some information relating to elastom elastomeric respirators, so the, the non-disposable ones, just to get a feel for how much of an impact do they have on the individual. And you can see from, uh, this is from uh, a paper by James done in 1991, where he combined uh, high heat and high work, uh, high, high heat and low work, low heat and high work and so on, to get a feel for the sort of physiological impact on the individuals um, and you can see the uh, the, the full face respirator obviously is uh, one that has one of the highest impacts uh, and then the half face compared to the, uh, the no mask I and mean, in the biggest impact is in that high heat high work area what is important to note about this study and as you know when, whenever you look at studies you need to dig a little bit deeper first off it was only done for someone wearing a respirator the, these respirators for an hour and the other thing, as I delved a bit deeper, was there were only four participants. So it's not the most you know, brilliant study, but it does start to give you an indication of the impacts of wearing uh, the respirators. So we mentioned that uh, it can be either a physiological or a psychological impact so when we talk physiological we talk core temperature so so how much does it actually impact and how is that represented in the increase in core temperature so there was some work done uh, by Hayashi and did some measures of rectal tympanic and uh, core temperatures wearing N95s and again using low to moderate workloads and they showed you know, virtually no significant increase of core temperatures so we weren't seeing it displayed in the, uh, the physiological results. Uh, in another in a separate study by Roberge, and if you, you, you uh, Google Scholar or PubMed, uh, the name Roberge, he did a lot of work in this area in relation to uh, uh, respiratory protection, particularly with health uh, healthcare workers. And his in his work, again, non-significant minimal increases in core temperature from wearing an N95 at low to moderate work rates. So similar results were found for, for heart rate and for respiratory rate between a control and N95s. Now, you have to bear with me. I am uh, working partially blind with this, so I'm not sure when I get to my um, uh, my questions. So, um, uh, Samira, if you can jump in when I get to slide 11, if I haven't already got there, and let me know, and I'll pause. Jump in and launch the folder. Thank you. So, what about at higher workloads? A study did identify the potential for carbon dioxide retention at levels of around about 2.9% 2, 2 when using uh, N95 respirators. So, 2.9 is starting to get right up there. Uh, breathing of levels of CO2 greater than 3%, you're going to start to see some, some adverse physiological effects such as headaches and potential anxiety. And it was not surprising looking back at some of the, uh, the complaints made by the healthcare workers of some of the symptoms that they were receiving, uh, that they were suffering from, sorry, as a result of wearing, uh, not being used to wearing the respirators and wearing them for extended periods of times in, uh, when the, under a, a fairly heavy workload. So it can also result in uh, increases in frequency of breathing and, and, and tidal volume, so the amount of volume of breath. And increases in uh, breathing resistance and respiratory rate have also been noted, again, when you, you start to increase that, that, uh, that work intensity. So it's starting to have that physiological impact at those higher levels. So it's, it's 
important to bear in mind. Low workloads, we're not seeing an impact. But as soon as we start to increase that workload, there is definitely an impact that needs to be taken into consideration. So there was a study on uh, N95 acceptance among healthcare workers. And in a study in Iran in uh, 2017, oh, we've, sorry, we've got our, um, our poll coming up. So I'll just wait for our poll before I go into this one and uh, we'll see what, what, what happens. So the question we're asking is approximately when were exhalation valves first introduced to the disposable N95 respirators? So um, I'll be interested to see the responses here. Let's start. Now, Rob. Excellent. Let's wait till we get to about 75% of the uh, audience answering. Right. Um, it's pretty close to uh, a consensus on 1970, right? And 73% 90 of the responses and, and going up, and 19% uh, saying 1960s, and 7% uh, saying 1950s. Hmm. Well, it was, it's actually 1970s. So it was in the 1970s that they first were introduced into the N95s. So it's good. Excellent, we'll move on from here. And again, you'll have to warn me when we get to slide 22 for the next poll. So as I started to say, uh, in a study in Iran in 2017, healthcare workers were asked to give their opinions about uh, the sorts of obstacles they believed were there, the barriers in using N95 respirators. I think this one's probably very, very topical with uh, our COVID situation at the moment and our healthcare workers wearing them. And these were the top six responses that they gave. First one was heat around the face, uncomfortable. You know, they, they weren't popular. They didn't like wearing them for heat around the face. The second one was inaccessibility to the respirator. So that they actually didn't have the respirators available that they could get to and wear them. There was some difficulty in breathing, so they didn't like wearing them because they, they imposed some difficulty. Pressure on the nose, again. Trouble communicating with patients and colleagues. And the last one's an interesting one. No one else does it. So, you know, a little bit of peer pressure. No one else is wearing them, so why should I wear them? So it's uh, they were interesting. And if you look at some of these, and think back to some of the comments we've been hearing about the wearing of the, the N95s in recent times, that they, they sort of start to ring true. And of course, physiological impacts, we mentioned those. So it's predominantly a form of discomfort, so claustrophobia. There are some people that do not like to put anything on their faces. Uh, half face or full face respirators cause a, a feeling of claustrophobia, and, and that can raise stress levels. As was pre in the, mentioned in the previous slide, pressure on the face. Some people don't like that pressure. And there it's often the perception that to get it to work properly, I've got to make sure it's pretty tight and you know you get that uh, exacerbation of the, of the situation. The accumulation of sweat. Um, there's an interesting um, uh, scenario here. Many years ago, I was working in a smelter and uh, came across uh, a gentleman wearing a full face respirator in, uh, in one of the reduction lines. And these guys are working in pretty hot environments and they, in, particularly in, uh, in Queensland, it, it gets even warmer. And uh, they just introduced the full face respirators. And just to prove his point that he wasn't happy with the idea of having to wear a full face respirator, he walked up to me, pulled off the, his res the, the straps from his respirator walked in front of, uh, walked in front of me and just went and tipped it out and all this sweat just poured out of the respirator so it uh, it can accumulate quite significant volumes when you you've got that profuse sweating he got his message across um, the the face fitting uh, uh, respirators can obscure vision uh, physically from their their actual uh, the size and and if you look at some of the uh, elastomeric respirators that have large cartridges on them, they can physically block. And of course, um, we saw from some of our, our politicians complaining about uh, they get fogging, as in they breathe out. And usually uh, fogging tends to fog up their glasses. 
So whilst it's difficult to quantify some of these physiological responses, um, whether they're individual or in combination with other impacts, and particularly if they're in combination with some of the physiological impacts, they can be a significant deterrent to wearing of respirators. So when you're rolling out these sorts of programs in the, the hotter climates or you know, in, the, in um, uh, hot work environments, there are things you have to consider because if they don't like wearing them and they're uncomfortable wearing them, they'll either not wear them correctly or they'll have this habit of pulling them off to, to, to get um, away from that discomfort. So things you need to bear in mind, physiological and um, psychological. Exhalation valves. Now we had a little question before about the exhalation valves. So they've been utilized in N95 respirators since about the 1970s. Now, some of the proposed benefit is that it assists with the, uh, the reduction of breathing resistance, humidity, uh, heat on the face, and carbon dioxide buildup. Uh, there's a small benefit in the reduction of internal pressure as well as the buildup impacts on the facial seal as you're breathing out. So some studies indicate that uh, the exhalation valves may not be as, have a signif as significant effect on dead space, humidity, respiratory rate, heart rate, core temperature, speech intelligibility, and so on, dead space, at low to moderate work rates as first thought. So Robert did some work in this, uh, and again, with the um, low to moderate work rates, and found that there wasn't as significant an impact. But again, once you get into the heavier work rates, it does have an impact and does become important. And I guess the other thing we have to bear in mind, again, harping back to our, our COVID scenario, is that the, um, the respirators with exhalation valves are designed to protect the wearer and not the people around them. So that's where is a, we have to draw our, our line as well. Uh, there's also a potential reduction in the temperature increase. So it can range from 0.1 to 0.4 or 0.8 degrees C as well. This is one that took me by surprise. I came across this in a paper and I hadn't really thought about it. Mouth or nose breather, does that have an impact? Does it matter? Well, apparently it does. But again, at low work rates, most individuals are nasal breathers. We breathe through our noses when we're taking things uh, at a, a lighter rate. As our work rate starts to increase, it tends to switch to oronasal, so we breathe through both our nose and our mouth. Eventually, when we're doing half, a, hard, uh, a lot of hard work, we tend to predominantly breathe through the mouth. So the positioning of the uh, exhalation valve can actually assist. Not a big impact, but it, uh, it, can be a, it can play a role. So where you've got the centrally positioned exhalation valves, uh, they're better aligned with the mouth breathers. So when we're doing uh, the heavy work uh, and we're um, and it's starting to, to, to build up and we're breathing harder, that centrally positioned exhalation valve is uh, where, we, where we need to have it. So if we're not breathing, uh, uh, heavily, they tend to say that um, the positioning of the valve down lower would, would be better suited. And you will tend to find that most modern um, face fitting respirators, uh, disposables in particular, excuse me, have that frontal lo uh, located uh, exhalation valve. Though I have noted, uh, excuse me, in recent times, a couple of respirators that have them off to the side and slightly lower. So it's an interesting uh, finding for me. Options to mitigate the impact. So if we're talking about respiratory protection, where we're, we're focusing on the individual and protecting the individual, uh, then utilize respirators with exhalation valves. And again, the, the benefits are going to vary depending on the, on the workload and the breathing intensity. Source the low breathing resistance respirators. Generally not as big an issue, as I mentioned, because the, a lot of the, the, the modern uh, uh, materials and the respirators are, uh, are quite good and around that, that 10 mark, so well under the 35. But as a result of the influx of um, some uh, face-fitting respirators from previously unknown or unrecognised 
manufacturers, then it may be something worth thinking about when you're, you're sourcing them. Psychological aspects uh, such as claustrophobia, discomfort from facial pressure also have a bearing on the wear time. So they need to be considered along with the, uh, the, the, the physiological impacts as well. And to a lesser degree, the positioning of the exhalation valve. Um, but as I said, limited flexibility as most manufacturers provide that centrally front position exhalation valve. So in summary, limited studies reviewed have demonstrated that the metabolic workload will not increase significantly as a result, as a result of the respirator wear in low to moderate work conditions. And again, I emphasize low to moderate. And this may be more significant in the heavy workloads. The overall impact of an, of an increase in facial sweating, skin temperatures, internal respirator, dead space temperatures, CO2 built up and the like can result in discomfort and uh, physiological impact on the wearer too. And this is going to vary from individual to individual and task to task, in environment and task. Now I've worked in uh, environments where there are guys that will wear a full face respirator for almost 12 hours a day. And they, they learn to adapt. And there are others that after 20 minutes, that, that, that's enough, they, they, they can't handle it. So you need to consider the individual. Respirators with exhaust valves may not be suitable with, when dealing with virus spread as they protect the wearer and not those around them, just re-emphasizing that point. So that was respiratory protection. And that is one aspect I thought we'd look at because it's becoming very topical uh, in the, uh, uh, in the COVID era and also as we're getting into our warmer climates in our workplace we'll start to be wearing them as well. But another one that comes up is clothing and this one often comes up when I get questions um, in, the, in particularly in, in summer and there are a couple of areas that I'll, I'll cover with this one. So clothing itself adds work. So protective clothing adds weight, it can restrict movement and thus increase the metabolic load. And as we, mem we mentioned before, going back to that very first slide, increasing the metabolic load can increase our internal heat and uh, the buildup of that internal heat on the individual. So that's an important factor to consider. It can complicate evaporation. So it, depending on what the materials are that you're making and how many layers you're wearing, it inhibits evaporation. And evaporation is the body's key cooling uh, tool, I suppose you could call it, keep cooling function. Uh, that evaporation of that sweat helps that, that, that cooling effect. As we move, we, we ventilate clothing. So body movement can increase ventilation through the, the clothing, thus impacting on the evaporation characteristics. So, you know, loose fitting, tight fitting, those sorts of things. So ventilation is another important aspect that we'll, we'll have a look at. And the wearer actually alters clothing characteristics. So how do I wear my clothing? Do I wear loose fitting shirts? I know when I tend to do um, work in, in heat, if I'm going somewhere, I'll wear a, a nice loose fitting shirt, not a tight fitting shirt, because you need that circulation. And sweat rate. Uh, as you sweat, increasing sweat absorbed into the clothing can infect it, can actually impact on the insulation value of the, of the clothing. So let's have a look at daily workwear first. Now this is the, the average high-vis outfit that uh, we'll all wear when we go to a site. And this is not the specialist type clothing, just our day-to-day -day cotton type. So generally standard cotton drill, uh, usually made from 155 to 190 GSM cotton, so square per square metre cotton. So that's uh, uh, so the 155s are the, are the lighter, uh, the cool garments and the 190s are your standard cotton drill. Some of the welder shirts will go up to 3, 310 GSM. So they're a bit thicker because they need that, that additional protection. Hazard specific, this is when we're starting to look at some slightly different clothing. For example, smelter shirts. Um, in earlier days, they were a wool, which was up around the 320 GSM or 340 or even higher. The more modern types are wool viscose and they range from around about the 210 GSM mark. So they're, they're a little bit heavier than the, the standard cottons. Arc flash clothing, uh, fire retardant clothing, uh, 
Some of these are what they call the uh, the modacrylic pima cotton para -am aramid nylons. And these are the different types of blends of uh, fire retardant materials. And they're normally 195 to 220. But where they start to impact is they have different um, vapor permeabilities and they can impact on the ability to sweat. So whilst they may not be as heavy, uh, their, their flame retardant capabilities and some of the, the additives and the fibers that are being used can impact on, on how the body evaporates that sweat. So it's something to, to keep in mind there. And here's a new area that's starting to evolve rapidly, uh, lightweight synthetics, the nanotextiles and treatments. So synthetic nanoparticles, these days can now be integrated into fibers or the textile themselves or, or the way they're woven. Um, or they can be applied as a coatings to the surface of the fabric. And they have all sorts of uh, weird and wonderful uh, contributions to, to, the, um, to the thermal characteristics of uh, the clothing that we wear. There's a slide later on where I talk about the, the really high-end technology that's starting to evolve. But these current ones are readily available. You know, the nanotechs and the cool techs uh, are quite um, uh, advances in the, the comfort and the wear of, uh, of modern workwear. One of the most common questions I get asked time and time again is about long sleeve shirts, short sleeve shirts. You know, the, I get the, um, the, the standard comment, we used to be able to wear our short sleeve shirts now they make us wear these long sleeve shirts in the heat and I'm going to suffer from heat stress because of it. So the question sort of comes up was, is that an actual concern? Is that a serious concern? Well, what I tried to do was to have a look at uh, measuring that impact. And I've done a rather simple approach. There are a lot more complex versions of doing this, but this is my um, simplified model. So. This will give us a, a, a chance to look at the impact of long clothing compared to short. And, and again, I, I stress it's a, it's a very um, uh, abridged version. So what I've done is I've, uh, I've utilised the rational index, uh, and in this case, ISO 7933, the predicted heat strain, because that allows me to alter the clothing characteristics in the equations, so to see what that impact will be. So... What we need to do is to get hold of the thermal insulation of the clothing in question. Uh, and this is measured in what we call CLO. Now, ideally, if you're looking for something like that, um, I think it's ISO 920. It's got a listing of all the different types of materials, all the different types of, uh, uh, of clothing ensembles and how they're worn and gives you the, this factor in there. So you can use that as one of your sources or references. So what I did is I looked up underpants, short, uh, shirt with short sleeves, wearing long trousers, uh, so a light cotton trousers, uh, long socks, uh, sorry, light socks, shoes, and that gives you a combined result of 0.5 CLO insulation. I then did the same for a long sleeve shirt. So everything else is the same, but they're now wearing a long sleeve shirt. And what we get is a, an increased clo factor of, of 0.1, so it goes to about 0.6. We then take this and put it into two different scenarios. Uh, and we keep the scenarios, we, we use the, the same clo factors in each of the scenarios. And this is what I ended up with. So my first scenario is 39 degrees C, black uh, globe temp 40, so we don't have a lot of radiant heat here. Relative humidity, 65%. Air velocity, about 0.5. So a, 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 a sort of a low, very low light breeze. Metabolic work rate, so 175. So they're not working super hard, but they're, they're, you know, they're shifting boxes around on a trolley or doing general trunk work. And we put in our clo factor for the short sleeve. And what it basically said, our limit, what we're using the limit here is um, the predicted core temperature. So we're saying... When it reaches 38 degrees, that's a time when we need to, to think about limiting it. So the time it took for someone wearing a short sleeve shirt in this environment to reach our limit was 31 minutes. If we put that individual into a long sleeve shirt, the limit was at 29 minutes. So it was two minutes earlier. And you think about, well, two minutes, not a big difference. 
We then did that in a different scenario where we, where we reduced the humidity. So we took it down to 45%. And for the short sleeve shirt, it was not exceeding. And for the long sleeve shirt, it was exceeded at roughly three hours. So what's this, what's this telling us? Well, it's telling us a few things. First of all, you've got to bear in mind that by covering up skin, we are covering up one of our key cooling mechanisms, the evaporation of sweat off the skin. So you're looking at a, a percentage of the skin that is now no longer uh, as readily available to evaporate that sweat off. It still can, but we're now covering it. So there is going to be an impact. The, the question is, how much of an impact is it? In these high humidity scenarios where evaporation of sweat is limited anyway, you're probably not going to see a massive impact. In the, uh, the scenarios where we start to get reduced uh, uh, humidity, you're probably going to see a more significant impact and it's going to start to increase uh, the Sorry, I've lost that one. So uh, as we get those the, the lower humidities, we're going to, to see an increase in the impact. So it will have a, somewhat of an effect. So it can have an impact in those sorts of scenarios. And of course, with less the humidity, um, the, uh, the, the better the evaporation process. The more skin available, the better the evaporation process. So, Again, I, I, I preempt the point. This is a very limited example. Uh, more details and varied scenarios you would need to undertake if you really want to get a better picture of this. This is just a quick, uh, a quick and dirty approach to give you an idea of, of the impact. So, increasing the length of clothing can have a negative impact, increasing heat stress, but to a limited amount, and it's very dependent on the environment. So, you have to keep that in mind. The environment plays a bigger role in the heat stress than the clothing. So, you know, yes, okay, we're going to get some impact by going from longs to, from shorts to longs, but your real issue is the environment, and you should be addressing the environment and those sorts of controls. You know, changing from short to longs is not going to make that, uh, a really significant impact. However, ultimately, the benefit needs to be weighed up against other risks as well associated with you know the safety risk the cuts the abrasions the burns and things like uh, uv exposures and cancers there is also a comfort aspect as it was with the respirators it may not be a physiological aspect but the comfort aspect can play a part so that thermal comfort area we start to delve into so bear that in mind as well so whilst i might be saying that there's not a massive physiological impact there is a comfort impact in there. So they all have to be teased out. So here is one of our polls. Some of you have, have been to my presentations before will know the answer to this one. Others won't. So the question I ask you is, who is going to get the hottest? What we have here are two Bedouin goat herders in the Kalahari Desert, right? Uh, one likes to wear black garments and the other one likes to wear white garments. And these are these, this is an actual study. I, I, I'll, I'll highlight that fact. So what I want you to do, well, I'm, I'll move on to the next slide. And, and I want you to have a look and tell me which one of these actually gets the hottest. Okay? So the black or the white. So while you're doing that, I'll move on to my next slide and I'll answer that one in a couple of slides time. So looking at colour now in clothing, so we've looked at short sleeve clothing, uh, now we're going to look at colour. How much of an impact does colour have in the, in the heat? Well, if you're looking at things like uh, a solar heat load, you know, white run, runs out around about 92 kilograms per calorie per hour, khaki around about 92, so you know, pretty much the same green 113 and, and black round about 145. So um, that's the net heat effect produced at the skin by uh, the, the absorbance of the, you know, when you're out in the sun absorbing the solar energy. So there is an impact by color. How much? Well, you know, if we have a look at, this is a, a table out of a, a, a 
paper done in 1945. There was a lot of work done on clothing in heat in the uh, in the late 30s and, and early 40s, predominantly because of the Second World War. And as the, the Second World War moved into the Pacific region, they did a lot more work. So there are a lot of papers done by the military in this area around uh, uniform fabrics, and they're actually quite interesting to read. But this is a table out of one of those studies. And you, you can see they look at two particular areas. They look at the uh, the contribute contributing to the heat load. There's a percentage and uh, oh, sorry an amount, and then there's a reflected percent. So the two components that they consider. So if we look at um, you know, cotton, white, we've got contributing about thirty three point two to the heat load. Excuse me. And the reflected amount, 66.8. So it's probably about the best. And then if we go down to um, some of the, the the darker, the cotton, denim, the, the blues, 67 uh, contribution, 32 reflected. So not as much. And if we look at some of the work done by Martin, uh, he went down and actually looked at um, flannel suits and dress suits. And you can see, you know, 95 contribution to the heat load and only 5% reflection. So obviously they're going to have some impact. So the type of, of clothing that you're wearing, the color of the clothing can have, a, can have an impact. So some key factors to consider in thermal comfort of clothing, air permeability. So it's generally accepted that um, the permeability of the fabric uh, is going to depend on obviously the porosity and the weave. So a nice, the open weave shirts tend to have better permeability and, and that actually decreases and increases depending on the stitch length. So the shorter stitch uh, length fabrics have uh, the less permeability. Thermal conductivity. So this is basically a measure of uh, how much the heat is transferred through the material. Now, are you getting the heat through the material? So the uh, it will also increase with the, the decrease in fibre fineness and also the, uh, the the tightness of the weave. Thermal resistance, so heat insulation properties of the textile material. So the higher the thermal resistance, obviously the lower the heat loss, but that also works in, re in reverse as well. So if you're working in an environment where you've got an external uh, heat source coming on, you would be looking for that sort of clothing that has got the higher thermal resistance to protect the individual. So it's, it works in reverse to someone that's looking for a cooler shirt. And thermal absorptivity. Um, smooth surfaces, uh, they tend to increase the, the thermal absorptivity because you're getting a higher level of contact with the human skin. And that's why microfibers provide that really cool feeling because you're getting that very high level of skin contact. And finally, thermal diffusivity. So a fabric that dissipates heat quickly will feel cooler than one that transfers the heat slowly because the heat is being retained closer to the body for a longer period of time. So one that dissipates it will uh, make that difference. Right. Vented clothing. I think there is a, a poll at the for the vented clothing too. I haven't answered the original who gets the hottest, that's coming up. But here's one on uh, vented clothing. Now, why would vented clothing be a benefit in the heat? So this one's a pretty straightforward question and most of you should get this one right. Again, we can refer back to our heat balance equation, one of our key uh, components of that heat balance equation. And let's see how we go. So it makes it easier to move. So movement within the clothing increases air circulation, thus improving sweat evaporation and looks cool. So it has a psychological effect. Well, I don't think we'll need to go to see any. Um, we've had nearly 70% of the audience answer this one. And so far, unanimous, increase air circulation, mm. improve sweat evaporation. Very good. I thought it 100%. I'll throw in the simple question here. Yeah, it is very important. The uh, the ventilation helps that air circulation. The air circulation helps the sweat evaporation and the, the sweat evaporation provides that cooling effect. And you'll see in a lot of modern clothing now, they're starting to introduce vents under the arms, 
the big vents on the backs, and even now we're starting to see them down the sides as well. You need to get that air circulating to evaporate that sweat. And as the sweat evaporates, we get that cooling effect. What's wrong with this picture? When I was going through looking at images on uh, at some of the suppliers, I came across this slide and I thought, well, yeah, you've now got high visibility, but you've also gotten rid of a lot of your ventilation. So when you're selecting where you're going to put your, your high-vis stripes, make sure you put them in a position that doesn't impact on the ventilation process. And interestingly enough too, um, also be careful how you select your, uh, your high-vis striping because that can impact on uh, the, uh, the heat component of the, of the, the shirt itself, as we've seen in um, some of the other hotter work environments, the, uh, the stripes can actually absorb quite a significant amount of heat and, and cause uh, some in, uh, injuries to the individual. There are now uh, modern uh, uh, stripes that are available that are cloth back that prevent that, and also uh, those that are ventilated to prevent it. So. So here's our response. Who gets the hottest? Well, I can tell you now that they're both the same. So we had 63% uh, saying that the black outfit, we had 12% saying the white, and we had 25% saying the white. Okay. It's a, it's a very tricky one, this one, and it's quite a fascinating process. If you have a look at the two individuals, right, the air surfaces are the same, the actual surface of the material, so the surface of the white garment is 41 degrees C. The surface of the black garment is 47 degrees C. Look at the airspace though. The airspace is 38 on both garments. The air going in is 38 on both garments. And the skin surfaces are the same. So why the difference? What happens is that the increasing differential in the surface temperature and skin increases the ambient air, the actual airflow through the garment. So we get a faster air th airflow through the black garment, which reduces the, that skin temperature. So whilst we both get, the, we end up with the same, you know, skin temperature of 33 degrees, what the guys wearing the black outfits tend to say is it's, um, it feels better because you're that uh, that uh, that better airflow, so it's uh, uh, it also adds that little uh, psychological aspect as well. But both actually work quite effectively. And if you want to read up more on this one, um, the, this is, as I said, this was a, a short paper written in Nature in uh, Nature magazine in 1980. It's quite an interesting uh, document. It talks about clothing as well. Now another question I can ask you here is. So what happens if these guys decide to wear a belt of some kind? What impact is that going to be? So this is another one, another poll for you. This will be our last poll. For the audience to stay in. Yep. So we're looking at no difference. The black outfit gets hotter. The white outfit gets hotter. Actually, there is a four, fourth option here, but. We'll go to that in a minute. So what we're doing now as we're talking uh, is that we are now uh, stifling the airflow. And when you look at uh, clothing in the workplace itself, one of the, the best forms of clothing is a loose fitting one piece coverall. Because what that does is that allows that air circulation. And same as with these two guys. But as soon as you put a tool belt on, what it does is it stifles that air circulation. So it reduces the air circulation. So the garments are going to get hotter. So in this case, our, our Bedouin in the desert, they're both going to get hotter, but the guy in the black outfit is going to get hot, much hotter because he's now lost the benefit of that increased airflow. So the That was the answer that the uh, audience chose as well. 85% of the black outfit got hotter. Very good. Okay. So uh, just a quick one on the wicking effect. Uh, this is, is basically around liquid transportation characteristics to help uh, aid sweat transfer mechanisms. So we're trying to, to get rid of excessive sweat. Now, um, 
we, obviously we need to evaporate the sweat off the skin because that's important because that's our cooling effect but when we're sweating profusely and we're getting a lot of build up we and it starts to drip and becomes uncomfortable what we need is the the mechanism to be able to wick that additional sweat off the skin and this is uh, a, a characteristic of different types of uh, of materials so we need that fact uh, the fabric to be able to do that so it's usually done via capillary action and uh, it helps increase the evaporation rate over a wider surface. So rather than just dripping off, it can be absorbed onto the uh, onto the garment and evaporated off the garment as well as off the skin. So there's some uh, new materials out there that increase this process. Um, and a couple of examples I found in a quick Google on the internet were Coolmax and Nanotex dry inside. Now I'm not saying these are the be all and end all. They just happen to be the two that came up. So obviously. There, the Google engines are working well for them. But uh, well worth uh, you know, investigating some of these types of materials if you can. Another area that, we, that uh, is a lot of work is being done in is the garments for construction workers. And there was a, an interesting study done in Hong Kong recently, specifically on the, that topic. There is a lot of construction work that was being undertaken in Hong Kong. And there was some, they wanted to know what is the best outfit, the most suitable outfit for the construction workers in the, the, the environment in Hong Kong. So they came up with these characteristics which they believed were, were, were the, the ideal clothing. So these are common characteristics for both the shirt and the trousers. First off, they need a thin vapor permeable fabric with moisture management properties and protection against UV rays. So that's one of the first characteristics they, they said was necessary. They needed to be light coloured to reduce that heat absorption because the construction workers are often out in the heat. They need to be loose fitting because we need two things. One, they wanted to be mobile and be able to move around. And remember we talked about the, the pumping action of the body moving and helping with the airflow. And also uh, we want good ventilation and convection heat loss. But there was also some shirt specific characteristics that they were looking for. One was the, the raglan style sleeves, which gives you better movement as the, it fits better, it's wide in the underarm area and gives you a, an open sleeve. And mesh fabric along the two side panels, they found improved convective heat loss. So they had these two panels down the side, which allowed the heat to, to, to move through. And they use breathable five, uh, 50 millimeter reflective strips to the chest to, to um, make sure that they, they, they met their high, the high vis requirements in the construction environment. So this is what they looked like. So this is what they were wearing originally and then the pale blue is what they ended up with. Uh, with. So a light, light clothing, it's thinner, uh, better thermal and moisture properties, uh, mesh reflective strips, Mesh fabrics on the vertical sides, you can see that grey area down the sides and also the reflective strips around the ankles. So if you're interested, the, um, uh, it's the, I've got that reference it's in Applied Ergonomics. You can't see it because of my stop sharing thing, but um, it's there. So if anyone's interested in, in that, uh, uh, that study, I can provide the, the, the reference. So, if that's, they've done this study, if that works so well, why don't we, we might as well get that for everybody. Let's everybody wear the, this light um, material, you know, nanotechnology, and it'll, it should suit us and we'll all be cool in the work environment. Unfortunately, there are certain safety considerations that come into play. Insulation. As I mentioned earlier, if you're working in a, an environment where there is a high radiant heat load, you want clothing that will provide some form of radiant heat protection. So we then tend to go to the, the high GSM thicker clothing. You know, you're getting up the, the 250 to the 300, which will protect you from the, um, uh, that radiant heat. So you have to balance off. What is giving me the biggest, where am I getting the, the biggest issues? Is it 
the radiant heat that's causing me to, to get hot or is it the fact that I need to be able to evaporate that sweat? And these are the sorts of things you need to consider. Cuts and abrasions. Um, long sleeve shirts compared to short sleeve shirts. Um, in a, a work environment, there are some sites that will say, you know, we need to be cautious of uh, cuts and abrasions to arms. We're seeing lots of these injuries uh, in the, the workplace. Therefore, uh, you have to wear long sleeve uh, shirts rather than short sleeve shirts. Flammability, you know, some of these uh, nanotechnology type materials and uh, are very light, they're, they're close fitting, they're really comfortable, but they're also very flammable. So you need to look at that part of it. So particularly, for example, someone that's wearing arc flash clothing or someone that's working in an environment where there are, there are flames, uh, it wouldn't be suitable, obviously. So you couldn't imagine, you know, one of our, our CFA guys going out wearing his, uh, his golf shirt because you know, it just wouldn't work. Contact burns. Again, um, this relates to the thickness of the material and also whether you're wearing long sleeve shirts or short sleeve shirts. If, you're, if there are hot surfaces or flying embers or flying bits of molten metal for a boiler maker, for example, you need to bear that in mind that they all play an important role. So you may have to go to a long sleeve and thicker shirt or a, a, an overcoat, some of the overcoats, thicker overcoats. And lastly, uh, UV radiation, uh, short sleeve shirts in an open environment. What is the actual you know, uh, increased risk as far as skin cancer goes. You know, there was some work done a number of years ago with, I believe, the, the postal services in relation to skin cancer and the increased risk for shorts and uh, short sleeve shirts. They have to take that into consideration and so do uh, most workplaces as well. So it's not that straightforward. So maybe the construction clothing that we just went through may not be suitable for all employee tasks and all environments. You have to consider the safety aspects as well as the um, the, the the heat uh, and the uh, the heat load aspects of the clothing. So that brings us to a, another area: disposables and encapsulating coveralls. So as it says, not all disposables are created equal. Yeah, you know, some are designed for protection from dust and grime, and that's all that they really do. They're quite permeable uh, and they breathe. They're, and they're there to stop you getting dirty. Others provide protection against liquids, you know, such as the, the old, um, the, the white Tyvex, you know, give you some protection from uh, the, the, the liquids, not as, the, and a little bit of protection from vapors, but mainly from the liquids. And obviously some are impermeable to gases, liquids and vapors. So they cover protection from the whole lot. But the thing to bear in mind here is as we start to increase, we're also reducing the amount of uh, capability of the body to evaporate that sweat. We are creating micro environments. So they will significantly limit the ability of the body to lose heat. So as soon as you start putting people into these sorts of clothing, you must consider the impact of increasing heat stress for them. And again, harking back to COVID, medical gowns. If you look at the medical gown, I'd never really looked at one closely until recently. They're designed similarly to pr protect the wearer from uh, from liquids, from bloods and and uh, uh, liquids containing uh, you know bodily solutions containing viruses and those sorts of contaminants. But they come in a number of categories, so they go from level one to level four. So level one is the minimal risk, you know, basic care. They're, they're the ones that uh, visitors sometimes wear when they go into a hospital or in a standard medical unit. So, you know, rel they're rel relatively permeable. Level two, and I think these are the ones that you tend to see more of in the COVID, um, you know, where you see people uh, dressed in the, uh, uh, like the one I've got up in the top corner there, taking uh, uh, swabs in our, uh, our COVID testing sites, they tend to be the, the level two, which uh, for drawing blood, suturing, and just general uh, exposures. Level three, this is during arterial blood draw. 
inserting intravenous strips, uh, intravenous lines uh, in the emergency emergency room and trauma cases where there's you know, potentially exposure to significant amounts of blood or and contaminations. And ultimately, level four. These are your high risk uh, required uh, for long fluid intensive procedures, some surgeries, pathogen resistance and infectious diseases are suspected. You would have seen uh, these worn in the uh, the Ebola outbreaks. So they were uh, the, you know, the, the yellow outfits that were very, very much impermeable. They are very hot to wear and they will increase the, the, the heat load significantly. So considerations. When we go out and buy protective clothing, often it has specification requirements built in on it. So it says, you know, uh, UV protection of 50, uh, arc flash protection of, of this amount or that amount. But rarely do we see any clothing specification or guidance in relation to thermal issues on the packaging or labelling. So if you buy um, some of these disposable overalls or arc flash clothing or whatever, does it say somewhere on that clothing to be conscious of the fact that you are now going to be increasing you know, the, the thermal heat load on these individuals? I don't often see that. We need more information on those labels and in the education in relation to the, the range of the thermal conditions in which they can be worn safely, and if not, some guidance as to what needs to be done. Where is need to be made aware of the potential issues? Yes, they're being protected, but there also are some complications associated with them. This is a slide I mentioned earlier on. We're getting towards the end now. This is called smart clothing, and I came across this in uh, some work done by Ken Parsons. This is the next gen stuff. So sensors in clothing that actually monitor the thermal state of the body and can provide warning to the individuals or to a central control base. So there, you're actually wearing a garment that says, you know, the, the skin temperature is this, or you know, the surrogate core temperature is that, or you're sweating this much, uh, and it, it, some of them are, are actually looking at the composition of the sweat and uh, measuring um, specific gravity. They're, they're, you know, very intelligent clothing that is, that is available. And then we get to a, a, an even higher level, which is called active smart clothing. So it no, not only monitors but it responds. So face change materials uh, are micro-encapsulated into the clothing. So when it senses the skin temperature is starting to increase, it changes from solid to a liquid, and it takes the latent heat effusion from the skin, results in, co in cooling. So, you know, and this is all built into the, the shirt that you're wearing. And nanotechnology memory materials, uh, they change shape, so they increase the size of the air layer. So again, skin temperature goes up to 36, something clicks and the, the materials increase in size, bulk up, increasing the, the airflow in the, uh, in the clothing or reducing it in the clothing. So quite clever. And then I was reading an article yesterday that's talking about micro pumps being built into the clothing. So you know, watch this space. There's some really fascinating stuff evolving in this area. And lastly, I thought I couldn't go past without at least looking at the helmets. So there was a study done here looking at the standard helmet, a passive ventilation helmet, and an active ventilation helmet. And I must admit, the results aren't uh, mind-blowing. They're pretty straightforward. So this is done by Davis in uh, around 2000. And the results looked at, uh, it basically said there's no significant difference in physiological parameters tested. So, you know, testing core temperature, heart rates, uh, respiration rates, the, the real physiological heat stress, uh, heat strain responses, they didn't see any, any change, no matter what helmet they were wearing. However, they did find that the dry bulb and the wet bulb temperatures in the passive ventilated helmets were cooler than the not ventilated. So wearing this middle helmet did feel cooler for the, uh, for the worker. So it did give that... Uh, that that subjective feel of coolness. And as we lose and gain heat through the head, it, it can play a role. And, uh, and the next step up, the, the ventilated, the actively ventilated helmets, and this is the, uh, the, the ones that, with the fan that blows through there, uh, had a significantly lower dry bulb 
of the of the dome space so it provided some cooling uh as a lower uh, dry bulb temperature and you also got some uh, some evaporation of the sweat on the head and face so that was a uh, uh it was a preferred but not the most preferred an interesting thing that came out of the study was that the weight and fit are also important so even though they were getting this active ventilation and coolness some of the wearers were saying but it's too bulky to wear so we don't like it so again there are always trade-offs so to wind this all up i just want to introduce a couple of cooling approaches now this is probably one of the, the least utilized tools that I find very effective when it comes to cooling a hot work environment. It's called a vortex tube. Very simple concept. Compressed air supply goes in through the top. The vortex is split into two air streams, a hot air stream, which is ejected at the bottom, and a cool air stream, which can be ejected at the top into an airline, which then can be fed to a helmet or to a vest. And it can be controlled. There's normally a little, little knurled knob on it that controls it, so it's like a little air conditioner. And the, the workers can control the, the temperature of that airflow as it comes out. So a very effective uh, uh, tool but if you've got compressed air available. And if you look at the control options, I'll show you one using a vortex in a minute. Face change cooling vests uh, have, are becoming more popular. Uh, basically, Filled with material that freezes at about 15 degrees C, so you don't have to freeze it in a, uh, in a freezer. It can be frozen in, an ice, in ice water in an esky, or as they call them in NZ, chili lint. And they can be, you have spares that are cooling while you wear them in a vest. They can be worn on the outside of a garment or on the inside of a garment. They can have some benefits. They're not super cold, so you don't get... The, the same vasoconstriction that you would normally get with an ice vest uh, so that as they cool at that, that higher temperature. But some guys like them. They think they're great. Others say they don't like the cumbersome feeling on, on the body. So, again, subjective there. If you're into the, the really uh, aggressive environments, that's where these vortex tube single or dual systems come into play. This is one that's available, um, an air vest, and also uh, you can hook on a, a helmet or a welding helmet. So it's a dual system with two airstreams. And you've, you can, as I said, with a vortex system, you can feed cool air into the vest or into the helmet. And uh, it works very effectively. The only issue you have with this, or one of the main issues you have with this, is you need to have an airline attached to it, which can be quite restrictive. So in summary, PPE clothing is worn to protect the individual from a wide range of hazards, and it is an important part of our daily workwear. But there are numerous variables associated with how clothing will impact under differing thermal conditions that we need to consider. Factors such as permeability, insulation factor, design, colour and fit can all have an effect on the impact of the clothing. Clothing and respiratory protective equipment should be selected according to the nature of the task and the hazards. So what is suitable in one work environment will not be may not be suitable in another work environment. So you have to take those into account. There may be work environments where a short sleeve shirt is quite suitable and serves the purpose quite well. But that same short sleeve shirt could be, could be introducing a hazard or numerous hazards in another working environment. So you need to think of those and balance them out. And wearers need to be better informed of those of the potential issues when wearing, particularly the disposables and the encapsulating. They need to know that they can't work at the same rate and not have a break, or that, that their their microclimate will be totally different than what it is outside, and it's going to impact on how they manage the heat. So, thank you for your attention. I've gone over a little, a little bit over time, and. Uh, Hopefully you've you've learnt a little bit out of this. I know I learnt a, a little, quite a bit actually, doing the research for it as well. So thanks for your attention. Thank you very much for that, um, Ross. I am mindful of time, but we do have a couple of questions here. I one or two of them um, from Steve Lill. Is there any benefit in wearing compression sports clothing under high years? For example, skins. Uh, 
I'm not sure, are we talking about thermal benefits? If we're talking about thermal benefit, I wouldn't have thought, unless you've, you've got some, some wicking effect, um, there may be other benefits associated with uh, uh, muscles and that physio physiology, which I won't go into because I know nothing about it. Uh, but as far as uh, the, the thermal component, I, I'm, unless you, you've got an improved wicking effect, uh, I can't see a, a massive benefit out of, of wearing uh, skins underneath the clothing. Any research into impacts of wet clothing, either from external water sources or wet from excessive sweating? Andy Morris. There, there has been some work done. Um, and I think going back to, oh, back to the 1990s, there was, uh, I know, um, Graham Bates and Rick Brake did some work when they were developing the thermal work limit uh, algorithm. They did some work on the impact of increased sweat on clothing, and they found that there was quite a significant effect. So if you would, um, it, it impacts on the insulation effect uh, of, the, of the clothing. So hence, uh, when you look at the, the TWL, they have a set uh, clothing insulation factor, I think 0.45, that they use because they make that assumption that it's going to be thoroughly saturated and it's going to impact on the on the uh, the clove factor of the clothing. So if you wanted to, to search on Graham Bates or uh, Rick Brake, I think they've done some work in that area. And th there'll be more posts that I'm pretty sure since then. I really haven't done much work in that area. Uh, Ross, it's been very informative. I hope everyone has uh, learned a few things. I know I have. Um, and uh, until next time, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.